Matt Taibbi, uh, a number of you first learned of him or knew about him, but learned a lot about him through the uh, Twitter episode where members of Congress, Democrats, were trying to shut him up, made accusations about him and his profession, and the next thing he knows, the IRS is knocking on his door. I bet that didn't feel very good, did it, Mr. Taibbi? <laughs> uh, it was a little surprising, um, you know, and uh, not that doesn't happen very often to reporters. So, yeah, that was that was weird. I want to thank you for everything you're doing, because it does take guts these days, because a guy like you, you know, you're viewed as he was on this side. Now he's on that side. He's a traitor. My view of you is that you're trying to bring information to the public and you're getting very nervous about this growing police state and these tactics and all the rest of it. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but that's how I'm reading what you're doing. And I see this piece in Racket News, and I spread it all over the world after my wife gave it to me. I said, what the hell? Are we going to go through this damn thing again? You want to tell everybody what you've revealed and what you have found here, please? Well, there, about in 2020, in the summer of 2020, there was a big media blitz about a thing called the Transition Integrity Project. Um, it had uh, roughly 100 uh, people involved with it, some pretty well-known people like John Podesta, Donna Brazil, uh, the current Energy Secretary, Jennifer Granholm, and they contested, they, they sort of war-gamed contested election scenarios, and due to a fluke, um, they were forced to leak their final report where it came out that they were, um, the, 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 sort of the Democratic side was planning scenarios where they m- might want to ignore um, a legal Trump win. And that same group appears to be getting together again. There was a story in, in NBC a couple of weeks ago. It's the same umbrella organization. It's slightly different personnel, but it looks like the same general exercise is reconstituting itself. So what are they doing? First of all, I understand from people I talk to that this guy, and you, you have him in here, this guy else, they're back into the stage trying to alter campaign laws, trying to do so under the radar to affect, they hope, a better outcome for the Democrat Party. Is that part of it? Yeah, and this is part of the whole transformation of kind of the left liberal advocacy space. Um, As you mentioned, you know, I kind of came up in that world. Um, You know, I, I, I was... A lot of my sources were at groups like Public Citizen and Crew once upon a time. Uh, But that was back in the early 2000s when these groups were not so heavily politicized. In the Trump era, all of these groups have become essentially what you call lawfare organizations. They're dedicated to filing litigation mainly, um, things like FEC complaints, doing whatever they can to try to prevent other people from getting on the ballot. Not just Donald Trump, but people in the third party, no labels group, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., other Democratic Party candidates. So there is a huge infrastructure of these groups that's out there now, and they're led by people, as you mentioned, like Mark Elias, who was Hillary Clinton's um, lead lawyer in 2016. And there was this letter that went out that you quote here that's pretty <laughs> damn bad. I mean, uh, anybody who – tell us about this letter. You mean the no labels one? Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, right. So basically there was a Zoom meeting involving – um, a, a series of these uh, pro-democratic uh, like NGOs, basically, uh, and they were issuing a general warning to anybody who might want to think about running on, on a third-party label against Joe Biden. They're saying if you have even a, a fingernail of a skeleton in your in your closet, we're going to find it. If you think you've been vetted for a run for governor, that's you're insane. That's nothing compared to what's going to happen to you this time around. We made that mistake um, before with people, uh, you know, like Gary Johnson. We're not going to make that mistake again. So they're very, very intent on making sure that nobody has a chance to compete against Joe Biden um, next year. Now, obviously, there are seats against Donald Trump. Uh, but they've they've never gone to the, this extent to make sure that third party uh, candidates and intramural challengers uh, can't challenge to this extent before. You know, Matt Taibbi, write this piece. It's incredibly thorough. Um, you list names, you list organizations, you list sources, and on and on and on. And you know, it's amazing. Maybe I missed something. 
Nobody <laughs> picks it up. How, yeah, it's like, what the hell is this? You've just laid out a massive, I don't know, conspiracy or effort. It's just a sleazeball operation, and it's going to have an effect on this election. It's going to have an effect if Donald Trump wins this election. We're going to again be at pistol aim at each other, and they don't say a damn thing about it. What do you make of that? Well, this has been going on, you know, in the last year or so. Uh, since the Twitter files, um, when when we saw in the Twitter files that there was this elaborate system where where the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, the officer of the Director of National Intelligence, where they were liaising with all these internet platforms and uh, universities like Stanford to engage in some very sophisticated, um, uh, you know, very organized content moderation, political content, uh, censorship. I thought that was a huge story. I thought that would, everybody would have to pick that up because, you know, mm-hmm. well, no matter what they thought politically, and there was nothing. It was like you could hear a pin drop after we put that story out. And uh, that's just the world we live in now. You know, I mean, I, I grew up in an era where reporters were not supposed to care um, how the information broke. Uh, and who hurt, was hurt by it and who was helped by it. But that's not where we are in the media now. Uh, things are different, and you just we just have to get used to that. If not this whole umbrella group, certainly elements of it, as you point out in your article, have been involved in this uh, ballot issue, the 14th Amendment, Section 3. This was considered, I'm a constitutional, that was considered like an idea of the, of the lunatics. And right. it's mainstreamed. And then crew takes it up. These other groups take it up. They start litigating it. Now it's like the centerpiece. I mean, even even some lawyers who are not Trump supporters, are, no, no, this ain't cutting it. And yet they really do move the narrative, don't they? Yes, and, and not only are they interested in that particular section of the 14th Amendment, they're also very, very interested in using the, the, the Klan Act um, as a tool of social change. Uh, the lead counsel for this group protect democracy which was pro- profiled by nbc they put out a um uh, an editorial in the new york times earlier in september of last year talking about how we have to start using the Klan act more um as uh to affect social change not just for civil rights cases and in big cities and police abuse cases and they when i looked they they had started to do it you know going back to 2017 you'll find all of these Klan X suits that were filed for things as ridiculous as Russiagate. Um, and these are highly, as you know, I mean, if you're, as an attorney, these are highly punitive, um, you know, sort of ty- types of litigations. And they're just throwing them out willy nilly in all directions. You know, people who haven't been convicted yet for January 6th offenses, they were suing them. This is a thing that's now become part of this lawfare landscape is they're they're just using whatever tools they have in the legal kit to go after people on the other side. But doesn't that suggest we have an institutional problem here? Number one, when federal prosecutors pick up this sort of, you know, this, this this sort of club. And number two, when judges not only entertain it, seem to embrace it. I mean, isn't that isn't that who should be hitting the the. Uh, the break on this stuff? Yes, and, and in some cases they did. You know, I did find some judges who looked at some of those Klan Act cases. One, one of them was really funny, um, is, 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 is summing up the case, saying that uh, the, the plaintiff's complaint was far from the model of clarity. I mean, you don't mm-hmm. often see judges actually picking on the uh, the lawyers in, in their decisions, but there is a section of the judiciary now that is embracing these kinds of tactics. And, uh, you know, we're in a new world where everything is politicized and they're filing them in such quantities that if they lose even 30 or 40 percent of them, it doesn't matter. Um, some of them are going to go through. And that's kind of the strategy with these 14th Amendment cases. They didn't win every one of them, but they they want enough to make the headlines to go to the Supreme Court and they're going to keep at it, and they're going, they're going to apply pressure to every part of the electoral process, including, you know, uh, mail-in voting requirements, um, you know, proof of citizenship for, for foreign voting. I mean, everything they're, they're going to do, and they have the money to do it. That's the difference. 
uh, Mark, I don't know if you know, I mean, going back to the early Bush years, the left was always broke. They're not anymore. Um, <laughs> there's now the a Republicans lot of are broke. <laughs> exactly, exactly. There's a lot of money in this world, and it's all going to lawyers, and they're not the old school, like, ponytail-wearing uh, former uh, public defenders anymore. These are all people who used to work for the Justice Department, the CIA, the National Security Council. They are purpose-driven attorneys who are making real salaries to file political suits, and that's what they do. You know, when you look at this and you delve into this and you live this, it's depressing, isn't it? Very depressing. I don't know how we pull back from this, do you? I, I don't. You know, I think this is, um, this is a, a very difficult time because, uh, you know, the world is so polarized and everybody has their own individualized way of receiving media, so... I often talk to people who are former friends of mine or, or colleagues, and, I, and I'll try to bring up some of this stuff, and they will have never heard of it because y- you will not read any of, uh, any of these things if you read the New York Times or the Washington MSNBC. So, you know, on that side of the aisle, you're just not going to get this information, and I, I worry about that, which, which is that you know, both segments of America are in media bubbles, and we're not... We're not getting the facts out to the public, which is unfortunate. My problem with all this is they keep talking about democracy and they use the least democratic approach to trying to influence elections, change the outcomes of elections, to um, torment and threaten. In this letter, it's tormenting and threatening people who dare to think about third party. But you win an election and you never win an election. It never ends. Right. Am I? Right. It, it, it's just now how do we destroy the guy now how do we get a case going against the guy now how do we impeach the guy now how do we go after his staff now how do we do this how do we break them financially how do we, you've got people sitting around destroying any kind of c-o-m-i-t-y comedy or traditions that i mean you look we've had big battles in this country i've been part of them but you go back to the civil war now, this is different this is like an attack on the voting system, on 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 the institutions of of, of democracy. I mean, this is this is for keeps. I think. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, we started to see, I think, this in Congress, and you know, the two thousand, the late two thousands, early two thousand tens. You know, there used to be some collegiality between the two sides, no matter what they said about each other during the week, they would get together at barbecues over the weekend, and that's how they would hash out legislation. They would, the, the important decisions would get made. Now, you know, there's this politics of personal destruction that is everywhere, and there is no subterranean communication whatsoever uh, between either of the sides. And these new organizations that are being built, they're not, they're not being built to, uh, to make change for everybody like you know like these old groups like the aclu or the league of women voters like they used to do things like try to integrate the workplace or end housing discrimination and that would be positive for everybody uh that's not what these groups are doing now they're they're doing things like trying to file fec complaints or bar complaints against lawyers who represented trump this it's war you know that that's what it is it's not um it's not a liberalizing institution and I, I think it can't lead to anywhere good, this kind of behavior. Uh, as you know, you know, if you have a law degree and you want to make trouble, you can do it very easily. For people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the lawyers. We've heard about uh, what, some, <laughs> what some fascists and Marxists have said, what they would do as soon as they take over with the lawyers. I want to thank you for everything you're doing, really. You're a straight oh, shooter. Yeah. That's what you're doing. And I'm going to keep promoting it to my little audience as much as we possibly can. So I appreciate and appreciate what you're doing. Thanks so much, Mark. I really appreciate having me on. <laughs> Take care. God, God bless. Take care. That guy's, he sees what's going on.